Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Orr, and um, I'm, I have the lovely job of being the Executive Director of the UK and Ireland Spill Association, which means I have to host all of these webinars that we do and love. And um, it's great to see so many people registered for what will be a fascinating webinar today with two excellent speakers who are now blushing. <laughs> well, I can see that because they're on the screen. Um, so uh, basically a little bit about the association. For those who are new to it, and some of you are, um, basically UK and Ireland Spill Association is the trade body for marine and inland response companies in the United Kingdom. And therefore we represent contractors, manufacturers and consultants. And we do all we can really to help promote them, but to also give feedback, to bring people together, to have networking events, to spread the knowledge of spill response and best practice to industry. We were at a chemical industries event last week, absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, yeah, they're all part of the chain and they all all part of the change, the, the, the chain of connections, which one needs to harness expertise so that we're prepared for the, uh, the transition to net zero. Now, alongside the association sits the International Spill Accreditation Scheme, which, um, provides accreditation activities for inland oil and chemical spills and delivers the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency scheme for the accreditation of marine spill response organizations. And so we have many, many accredited members um, who, are who are based primarily in the UK, uh, but work all UK or Republic of Ireland, but work all over the world. And many of them are deployed now dealing with issues in the Philippines, issues in uh, in Gibraltar, OS35, and still out in Peru. So yeah, so they we are we have we have members and we have association members and accredited members working all over the world at the moment, doing a fantastic job. Now to get our work done, we have a number of working groups. And this series is going, this is the, this is the first of a series of six webinars which will come from the Marine and Manufacturers Working Group. And the reason that the membership of the group is a mix of those who manufacture, but those who use or specify their equipment. Um, and with the change in, in risk arising from alternative fuels, the group has grown into a very multidisciplinary group of member companies, occasionally regulators, some academia, and will continue to grow. And the picture that you see there, apart from being a place that I'd love to be at the moment, is the Wakashio. And if you recall, the Wakashio unfortunately drove into the reef where we're, where the photographer is obviously standing to take this beautiful picture. Um, it ploughed into the reef and it en eventually it discharged about 800 tonnes of, um, of very low sulfur fuel oil into this pr pristine environment. Um, and, and it resulted in the complete loss of the vessel, which was tragic. Um, this was the first loss of very low sulfur fuel oil but the implications for it that have significance because if you like it's the start at the one of the starts of the new fuels as we move along the energy transition and what we're going to be talking about today is really the energy transition itself now under the united nations sustainable development goals uh, which were produced and i'm sure everyone on this call will be well aware of um it forced us, forced everyone or everyone to look at how we do things such that we can protect the environment that we're in. And it forced the International Maritime Organization, who if you like are the regulator for all things marine, uh, to adopt an action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from shipping. And we've seen the move, we've seen the move away from high sulfur fuels, which have now virtually disappeared. And uh, we've seen the significant reductions in NOx emissions by prohibition by the EU, and that opened the door to very low sulfur fuel oil, really the first of the transition fuels, and LNG replacing some of the traditional fuels. But with this, with the change and the benefits to the environment, come, the, come um, limitations and an appreciation that they are different to the fuels that we're traditionally used to. Now, what's also happened is that the pace of the pace of change in, pro, in propulsion fuels 
driven by shipping companies now means that in commission or in build now are many dual fuel vessels. It could be that they're methanol and LNG. It could be that they're uh, LNG and batteries. It could be some are even supplemented by wind power. So we're seeing quite a change occurring. And the purpose of this webinar is to talk with is to talk from a responder's perspective, but also from a salvage perspective about how we're going to approach this and the implications that they have for both spill response and salvage, because obviously both spill response and salvage work hand in hand whenever there's an incident uh, involving a vessel. So at some point, there's going to be a grounding, there's going to be a collision, there's going to be a fire, or there's an incident where the where the vessel will need the in, well will need intervene, intervention. And as as new fuels arrive on the scene, the further we we move from what we currently understand to products that have characteristics that make them challenging, and so that's what the this webinar will address. So I'd like to introduce Marcus Russell from Oil Spill Response and Oliver Timify from Blue Tac Marine, who are going to take you through this. So I'll just hand over to them. Thanks, Mark. Let's see if I uh, share my screen. So thanks. first of all, thanks for the introduction, Mark. Um, what we will do is just take 30 seconds of everyone's time So moved on. Yeah, just 30 seconds of everyone's time um, just to introduce Oil Spill Response. Hopefully most of the people on the call will know who we are. Um, but just for the avoidance of doubt, uh, Oil Spill Response are a tier three response organisation, which is the largest international industry funded cooperative. Um, so we've got bases in, in the UK, Singapore, uh, the States, uh, Bahrain, Middle East. Um, our membership is made up. We've got 40 shareholders now, which are mostly um, the oil majors, oil and gas majors, but we've also got a growing um, group of members from the shipping industry and uh, smaller independent oil and gas producers, um, as well as also a growing number of government members, um, so which we can include uh, the, the UK MCA. Um, and Mark mentioned earlier about the OS35, um, that the Port of Gibraltar is one of our members as well. Um, through our um, shipping and salvage engagement manager, Steve Storey, about four or five years ago, we first made contact with Oliver um, and his team. Um, and they spoke a very similar language to us about preparedness and being ready for events. So um, there's a natural synergy and, and things have kind of just grown from there. So Oliver, I don't know, are you, um, are you happy yeah. just to do an intro, intro for BlueTac? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, um, yeah, thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, yeah, my name is Oliver Timofey, and I'm one of the founders of uh, the company BlueTech. Um, we are a relatively new player in the um, in the marine salvage, marine incident management market uh, since 2020. But we originate, or the most of the, let's say, the members of BlueTech originate from the likes of uh, uh, Ardent, Switzer Salvage, uh, et cetera. So we've been around for quite a while experience wise in this industry I started uh, blue tech in 2020 um yeah it's emergency preparedness emergency response focused uh, marine solutions provider um whereby there's a long strong long and strong focus on the whole preparedness scheme of things in order to uh, mitigate risks and trying to be prepared for the present and the future challenges um and preparing the likes of ship owners um insurers uh, marine governments etc um we are a cooperative and we have uh, all kinds of alliance partners globally that uh, that we work with and work for uh one of them is uh, is uh, oil spill response and that's how we've been uh, together been uh, engaged um on incidents but also on the um, uh, incident management emergency preparedness type work and specifically uh, decarbonization uh, yeah, thanks, Marcus. That was just on time. Um, so th therefore, combined our services, uh, you can see that we run the full scheme of, uh, of incident management related uh, services. Um, the background is, and that's also what Mark already mentioned at the very start, is that um, you know, if you look at I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, the oil spill responder and the salvor 
they worked quite well in silos during a, a certain incident, marine incident. If there was a salvage case and there was a release of uh, uh, of, uh, of of fuel or whatever the the, the spill uh, spill relates to, it was all run in silos. And yeah, because of the present challenges, uh, the increase of complexity during uh, salvage cases, you could say that the responders, and that's not only a salvo or and an oil spill responder, but all in all, in general uh, terms, including waste management uh, related services, is becoming more and more integrated. So. It's become a, a kind of a response supply chain whereby if you actually do your work well at the very start uh, on the preparedness side of things, uh, this will have a, a, an influence whether other types of actions will be needed if an incident or whether they can be mitigated. Um, and therefore, the, the cooperation between the responders, in this case, uh, OSPO response and, and Blue Tech, uh, is getting more and more connected in case there, an incident would occur. Uh, because obviously uh, a, a salvage master or a salvage team at the very start uh, can already think ahead towards uh, what needs to be done on the waste management and what in the meantime, what his, let's say, work and his salvage plan is related to oil spill response. Um, because obviously the marine authorities are, are very active during an operation and, um, and obviously they want all the risk again mitigated. So the more we can work together, uh, the better result uh, at the end for for all the clients and all the stakeholders. Nice one. Cheers, Oliver. Okay. Um, I think Mark's already touched on it um, a little bit in in his intro, but you know look, we all know the the problems that we face with global warming. Um, it's a global global problem. Global solution is needed. Um, Paris Agreement sets a target of you know, limiting um, increasing temperatures to below two degrees C. Um, and as part of the, uh, as a UN body, uh, the IMO set its own set of figures. It's it, it's estimated, and I've, I've read this in several places, I can't quite quote the, uh, the sources, but um, that maritime traffic as a whole probably accounts for 3% of global emissions um, as a whole. So it's it's quite considerable. I think it's around the size of maybe a, a, a medium-sized country's um, emissions. So there's definite need for the IMO to do something. The targets that they've set themselves have been criticised and or um, or have been at least accused of not being uh, ambitious um, enough. Um, we can see there that you know they're looking for a 40% reduction uh, by 2030 and 70% by 2050. But um, I think what we're starting to see is that industry itself is probably being a little bit more proactive um, is probably trying to work on a little bit of a faster time scale and there's there's lots of initiatives research and development that's going on that's probably gonna gonna sort of be ahead of, of that um of that timeline um uh, just for awareness a couple of things that the imo initiatives that the imo have introduced um sort of a, on that timeline there was sort of like coming into the the middle phase, the implement, implementation uh, stage, but they're they're looking at um, what can be done with the global fleet as it currently is. So they're looking at um, um, energy efficiencies of existing ships, uh, an index. So looking at measuring how efficient current vessels are, um, and baselining where their performance are against what they would expect, and then setting a, a set of improvements year it's like a year on year improvements how they can um, improve or reduce the, the carbon footprint of some of those vessels so it may be things like um, biofouling cleaner holes more efficient propellers things that can be done that are incremental rather than the wholesale changes such as complete new um, propulsion systems and and um, you know high high cost on the longer term what they're looking at is the alternative um, fuels zero emissions those kinds of things so that's kind of where um this presentation is going to focus on more um but it's it, it's probably worth just just pointing out at this point that a lot of what we talk about where it's 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 new technology the infrastructure doesn't exist uh, the, the the technology even for some of the um the combustion engines that are going to burn these new fuels doesn't exist yet and it's still in development so it's it really is a bit of a, a crystal ball but the the rate for change um is is quite uh, is quite pressing um rolling that all in together what that means is you know as emergency responders um there's going to be a whole lot of unknowns there's going to be a whole complete um change in the ball game 
Uh, again, Mark related earlier on to IMO 2020, where they wanted to reduce the sulfur content and the very low sulfur fuels and the low sulfur fuels that have come in. Um, in terms of response, that has completely uh, turned uh, our world upside down. The normal cues and the properties that we would look to to see how a prop, uh, an oil may behave or may, it may weather and what skimmers we may use, they don't really apply anymore. Um, so we're, you know, we're kind of looking at things from a different lens in terms of low sulfur and very low sulfur fuels. But this isn't sulfur content we're talking about with alternate, it's the, it's the carbon content that they want to reduce. So um, there are probably what we call some, some front runner alternatives. The, the, the unfortunate truth is there's no silver bullet. We're not going to just get rid of um, the, whole, the old residual heavy fuels and remove them and replace it with a single, a single option. There's a, it's a little bit of a patchwork quilt. There's lots of different options and lots of different um, challenges and lots of different various benefits that come with each, with each fuel. So we're, we're just going to touch on some of them now um, and not going to go into any real great detail. But again, Mark's mentioned some earlier. The front runner, the, the one that's here now, is, is probably um, LNG or liquefied natural gas. Um, that has been safely transported by sea for over 50 years now. Um, you know, even back in the day when I was at Sea with Shell, there was a, a small but profitable fleet of LNG carriers that they operated for in, in Brunei or on behalf of the Sultan of Brunei. There have been very few incidents, um, you know, certainly no major incidents. We're not talking like a Torrey Canyon or a, an Amoco Cadiz that, that, would, that would change the, the landscape in terms of response in that respect. So it's very well regulated. It's been very safe. Um, and in that respect, the regulations that are in place are quite well established. Um, there's different codes, different IMO regulations regarding um, the use of the boil off gas. So those tankers, those gas carrying tankers would actually use some of the gas from the cargo into the boilers. Um, and it was, I say, in my experience, very clean, very efficient and um, worked quite well. But it's it, but it's also very well regulated the the rules that they must abide by to be able to take the cargo or take the gas from the cargo put it into the boilers and burn it for a means of propulsion there's um strict regulations in terms of uh, how the vessel's constructed and the materials that can be used and the standards it must apply to and then there's also uh, rules for how uh, the ship to shore connections are made and those kinds of things so it's it's coming from a very well established perspective the way that it's transported itself, um, it is a gas, but it's uh, it's refrigerated. It's it's brought down to its its boiling point, so it's transported at minus 162 degrees C. So it is um, is cryogenic, and of course it is. I say it's uh, it's explosive and flammable by nature, um, but it's also water insoluble. So in terms of um, intervention of what response could happen. We've never had to practice it, we've never had to use it, but there's very little in terms of um, intervention that could be done. So we're not talking about booms and skimmers and things like that. Um, even if, if an incident was to occur, we're not going to be um, heavy on the terms of intervention. The reason that I've put it in as a transition for fuel is also that LNG is a, is a high content of methane. It's also in itself as a powerful greenhouse gas. So um, any unburnt gas from, uh, from combustion, goes through the exhaust system and it you know can actually be contributing to, to global warming. Um, there's also the, the well to wake considerations, how much gas may have been released um, from its from when it was extracted in the ground to the point of processing transportation and actually into um, into the engine itself. So but LNG is one of the one of the forerunners at the moment. It's here, it's present and it's being used. And you've, you may have even seen some shippers that are um, actively promoting their, their vessels that are powered by it. Some of the other options that are out there, um, one of them is hydrogen. Um, it's, uh, I say again, uh, its behavior is very similar to, um, to LNG, but as a liquid, it's actually carried at an even lower temperature. So you can see they're minus, the boiling point is minus 253 um, degrees C. Um, and it is ex it's explosive and, and highly flammable. So I think we're, we're all familiar with, um, with what the dangers would be. And again, what it means is in terms of intervention, there's probably not so much that we could do um, in terms of um, uh, boots and skimmers or a physical response. 
Another popular one that we're starting to see quite a few um, shippers um, uh, take interest in as a future source of fuel is ammonia. Um, the, the main differentiator with this is that it is actually toxic. Um, so it's toxic to, to human and marine life. So if we have a spill, we know that there's going to be some form of consequence to a marine environment. Um, unlike hydrogen and LNG, this is highly soluble. So there will be high concentrations. There will be other um, you know, deficiencies in oxygen. There'll be all these kinds of things that will um, have a knock-on effect, um, which there have been studies. We have some understanding of what they may be, but we haven't actually got any case studies that we could actually go back and, and, uh, and, and check. Um, in terms of transportation, there are different options uh, with ammonia. It, it could be carried either fully par or partially refrigerated, or it could be temperatures under pressurized conditions just to keep it into that liquid state. But that will have implications on the, the type and the design of tanks that are used to carry it. Methanol is, a, is another of the, uh, the options that is out there um, that's being talked about. Again, it's um, there's nothing new in, in these uh, substances that we're talking about now. They've been used in various ways and forms over sorry, many years. Um, but in the context of being transported and used certainly as a marine fuel, it's, uh, it's, it's getting into um, to new territories. Um, there's also um, one of the options would be carbon capture and storage. So this would be to continue burning the same um, hydrocarbons, um, but instead of um, allowing the, the exhaust to escape, there's, there, need, there would be technology developed that would actually extract the carbon from those gases. They would then need to be um, stored, which would generally be as a liquid on board, um, on board the vessel. Um, and then obviously once the vessel gets into port, once the tanks are full, they would need to be offloaded. There would need to be infrastructure to be able to receive that. And then obviously infrastructure again for the onward, um, the onward journey to its final um, sort of a storage point, which maybe it could possibly be um, uh, disused um, oil and gas wells. That onward journey, that final part, it's actually quite interesting itself. What we're seeing now also is designs of vessels for liquid CO2 um, tankers. Uh, again, this is something that up until now has been done very small scale. Um, it's been very small volumes transported for um, the food and beverage industries. But you know, this is going to be a con this is going to be um, orders of magnitude bigger. We could be talking about uh, tens of thousands of tons of liquid CO2. Um, again, carried at various pressures, and we need to start thinking about you know what would happen if one of these vessels got into difficulties. The final one on the slide here are the uh, e-fuels e and biofuels. These will be, um, or drop-in fuels, you may have heard them. These are ones that could be mixed with existing fuels or they're made through uh, renewable energy sources. Um, so again, they may have more, uh, they will, these will behave more similar to um, the, the existing um, fuels that we use. They'll be more oil-like, but um, again, what I say, more oil-like should be more persistent. It may be possible to use booms and skimmers with these, um, with these types of, uh, substances. So that's a, a flavour of the alternatives. But again, um, just to reiterate the point that the technology and infrastructure for a lot of these doesn't exist yet. There's a lot of studies and a lot of development work going on, um, you know, with, with a, a lot of financial backing that's going on. So the, the timeline is so it's quite aggressive, but there's a lot of work done being done by industry to, to get these into the, the mainframe. To look at the implications for spill response uh, or for emergency response a little bit more, um, it, it's probably worth just setting the scene a little bit and comparing where we are, sort of like with oil and, and where, we, where we currently are with a lot of these fuels. But um, in, in terms of spill response, we're from a, we're coming, I was going to say from a privileged background, but what we have at the moment is based on a lot of painful lessons that have been learned. Everybody can rattle off, you know, Torrey Canyon, Amacoca Deers, Exxon Valdez, the Erica Prestige. A lot of these spills, the, the truth is that regulation has changed. It's been forced to change. We've brought in things like OPRC. We phased out double hole tankers. So there's been a lot of learnings, a lot of lessons um, in terms of um, response capability. Dispersants have moved on sort of like leaps and bounds. So, um, so it's from a 
I would say a privileged background, but it's from a it's from a very well informed um, angle that we come from. With alternative fuels, we do have um, understanding, we do have experience of transporting and possibly as cargoes, but um, to, to varying extents of, of experience. But um, what we don't have is the, the knowledge and understanding um, of how um, you know they can be safely used um, and and how we would respond as an as a, an industry or a community should there be an incident involving you know vessels that are powered with these fuels um you know the number one priority is always going to be safety so that is probably going to govern a lot of what can or can't be done so in terms of capability um it does need to evolve um i've put on there thinking back that we have had limited experience i don't know if uh, you remember the algin platform in the north sea in 2012 um, where there was a, a, a release um, of gas and condensate. Um, and more recently, the, the, the um, alleged sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. But if you remember, the pictures there were just an exclusion zone until the, the pipe has um, sort of drained itself of its, uh, of its content. Um, there was very little, there was no intervention. Um, so it may mean that in terms of responders, we need to be more aware of the consequence and monitoring the effects. So whether that is atmospheric monitoring or you know what are the longer term implications of, of, of these types of incidents and the, the effects of releasing uh, some of these gases and uh, toxic substances. In terms of incident management, um, for us, I think like I say, it's, it, they're less persistent. Um, that you know a lot of these are volatile, so they're going to they're going to flash off. Um, so we will need better monitoring, better environmental uh, assessment of the consequences, and then the big unknown there would be the uh, media interest. Um, you know we don't just know how. If you compare uh, incidents such as the Exxon Valdez to to the Nord Stream pipeline, the Nord Stream pipeline went away quite quickly. It didn't you know it was a matter of days and it was gone. Um, similarly with Algin, you know these aren't major headline news that persist in the, in the media for, for days or weeks. So that's a little bit about the response. In terms of the risks, um, there's, there's obviously going to be um, a lot of risks that come in um, that we probably just don't understand um, as well at the moment. Um, obviously, there is the, the scenarios, I think Mark touched on it, if it's fire, collision, grounding, you know, what, what do we do? What can we do? Uh, what can, you know, uh, what, what could be done with a, a casualty vessel in that. And I know Oliver will come on to it. There's also going to be new risks, um, such as handling, or when I say handling, we bunkering, um, let's say, ammonia within a built-up area, or within, a, within a port limit, such as at the minute, at, let's say Southampton, um, which is the local port, where they're, you know, probably the Whitakers are performing bunkering activity on a fairly regular basis or a daily basis with HFO and MGO. But, you know, we are, up the ante with a, a, a toxic fuel such as um, ammonia you know what are the changes that need to be done there and what happens if there is a, a spill or a release there's also going to be uh, increase in risk as we start producing and transporting and consuming more of these products um, such as ammonia the, the methanols the ethanols um, lngs greater volumes will be traded they're all going to be transported um, and what we're seeing certainly with LNG at the moment is that the trading routes are becoming more diverse. 10, 15, 20 years ago, the routes were quite limited. Um, lots have been going from Australia or Brunei to, to Japan, but now there's a lot more diverse trading routes. So the, these vessels are going into areas that maybe they weren't before. Again, to go back 15, 20, 30 years ago, it was a very niche market. Crews were very highly trained. Um, now, as the as the global fleet gets bigger and bigger, we need to sort of start thinking about the competence and confidence of crews to handle uh, these uh, these pro these uh, products. Um, I won't touch too much on the challenges for salvers, but obviously there's a lot of things there. We're talking about electric vehicles. You know, if you've got electric vehicle fires with you know with uh, some of these fuels as a as a, a means of power in the vessel, there's obviously imp uh, implications and complications. Um, and then I say we've got um, varying degrees of complexity. I think this is going to follow into the, the next slides that Oliver talks about a little bit more. Um, but finally, if there was to be a major incident, you know, it, it, it depends on what the, the public perceptions could be, the reputation um, of, of some of those 
um, markets that we'd need to be start thinking of. I think this is over to you, Oliver. My mouth's drying out, so I need to take a drink, but I'll pass over to you, Oliver. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Um, yeah, so yeah, the last slide was a lot about the challenges, right? Uh, you know, and there's definitely a, a few ahead of us, whereby, uh, you know, like Marcus said, uh, the, the trading of the of the crew, um, you know, in, in case of a salvage case or a response, you're heavily dependent on the capability of the crew, especially in the first 24, 48 hours, dependent on what happens in the initial stage. Um, that the crew of today, if, if you go to a nautical school, they're mainly talking about the traditional fuels and not even talking about methanol, ammonia, or the new fuel types. Well, by in the future, once they're ready and they step on board of a ship, uh, the likelihood that they will be sailing with the new fuel systems is, is quite high. Um, and the same goes for uh, for other types of responders like us, whereby yeah, you have to we have to keep uh, track of what of what the new challenges are uh, and how can we prepare for those. Um, you know, in the last um, last many many years, uh, we were all focusing and responding to the traditional fuel systems uh, and fuel on board of of casualties. Um, it was it, it is still a very proven technology. You could even say that a uh, oil spill response uh, and uh, oil removal operation whether it needs to be removed or it stays on board in case of a casualty um it, it's all based on the on the same parameters that you're trying to contain it you're trying to keep it in a position whereby it doesn't uh, leak or there's no further catastrophe when she's aground or where she's uh, likely when she's going to sink or anything with it um so again it's more of a commodity uh, and you still see those challenges today whereby uh, there are cases around the world, even even right now, uh, and you have traditional fuels on board. That it's a challenge to take it from the vessel with the right equipment. In this case, uh, a hot tap solution, uh, ROV solution, um, uh, uh, what is it? A, a divers or saturation divers? If that is the way to to go for it. So while we are handling, let's say today's challenges, and while the let's say the um, uh, the, the solutions are all proven, tested, used many, many times, uh, and with its challenges that come with that. Uh, obviously, we have to already think about what are we going to do um, if there's a, an ammonia or a, a methanol propulsed asset? Uh, what do we do with the, the fuel on board? Um, the last couple of years, of course, we've been very busy with uh, LNG because that was already, uh, let's say, on the cards and growing uh, uh, gradually and, and dramatically. Um, and even there, uh, there was there was, has been quite some challenges to to see if if a let's say a LNG propulsed vessel was uh, uh, was or is salvage proof, meaning that a salver can actually do something with the asset in case it goes aground. And of course, the the reasons or the background for uh, for handling the fuel on board of a vessel with new fuel systems is has generally a different. Uh, a different background, a different reason, right? It's it's not that there's going to be an immediate spill uh, in a traditional way. We're more looking at, is it safe to board a vessel uh, whereby the, um, the containment of the fuel, uh, the pressures uh, on the fuel systems, um, et cetera, if it's still safe for a salvage team or a response team to go on board and to mitigate the uh, the, the casualty, or is it actually even better to stay away? Uh, those types of of course, those types of responses are are frustrating, and it needs to be thought of before, uh, yeah. Ideally, uh, we start sailing with those new fuel systems, and like Mark has already said, it's not one fuel system, uh, not one system in itself. It's it, it's a lot of different uh, systems we're looking at. Uh, you know, even today, looking at ammonia, uh, the storage of those of ammonia on board of uh, of ships is done in three different ways with different pressures ranging from obedient pressure to uh, four to eight bars to, to 17 bars. And for that response, you know, the salver needs to be prepared. They need to know what they're doing, uh, ideally together with, um, with the crew on board and, and, the, and the other types of service providers that are part of that. So therefore, you know, today, if you look at it from a new fuel system perspective, um, you know, we're looking at from a more of a safety mitigation plan uh, and, and not a spill per se. And you could also say that the vessels are not prepared and neither are the responders uh, to do something. It's all 
unfortunately, a lot of the solutions are all paper driven. Um, and there's not really a track record which we can fall upon other than, let's say, ammonia being a cargo uh, in a sense. So, and I'm also must say that the amount of casualties in that area for ammonia, methanol, et cetera, is very, very limited compared to container bulkers or other types of vessels that, uh, that have, a, a, have an incident. Marcus, can you go to the next slide, please? So if, if you look at you know, the comparison of where those scenarios lie in, um, today, and if I'm now looking also again towards LNG for now, um, is that you have the differentiation between LNG as a fuel and LNG as a cargo. Uh, Marcus already mentioned the, the, the trade routes, um, the, 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 that there's different, there's changing a lot. Uh, the crew training, you, know, you have a lot of, let's say, LNG specialists working with LNG on a daily basis. Those are generally the specialists that even the salvage responders call upon because they know the work on how to work with LNG uh, very well and much better than, uh, let's say, other, other trades or other types of work that they do. And you could say the same once we go into the new fuel systems with methanol, ammonia, uh, et cetera, is where do you get the, the capability from? Uh, generally not from, from the crew that has done a one or a two or a three day training to familiarize themselves with an, a new fuel system on board and they start sailing with it. You need to go to the, the specialists that have been working with those uh, systems on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so therefore those steps need to, be, need to be made in order to, uh, uh, to, to do a response in the first place. Um, first and foremost, what we also see, and we've seen with LNG and unfortunately we're also seeing it with the new fuel systems, once they're, they're in the verge of being implemented, that the types of risk assessments or assessments that are being done do not involve or generally have a limited involvement on actual casualties. It's all shipboard focus on running with the fuel systems in the trade routes, whereby there are some risks related to handling of it, but nothing relates to a, uh, a situation whereby you cannot contain the pressures anymore, you cannot contain the temperatures anymore of the new fuel, fuel system on board. So more needs to be done on that part in order to get more familiarized with the risks. Um, and first and foremost, it's not a nice thing to say, but of course the, also the regulatory class, et cetera, are running behind towards what the real challenges are if things go wrong. And it's similar to what we saw when electrical vehicles came into play on, on, on the roads um, uh, and you saw those cars driving around was roadside assistance ready to handle those types of uh, cars if there would be an, uh, an electrical vehicle fire? Well, the same goes, of course, of, uh, to alternative fuels today. So what we're looking at today is besides the fact of running a risk assessments, running the scenario planning or working towards potential to solutions of taking the, uh, uh, the fuels off, um, is ob obviously also having the right tools in place. You know, having the, a, a bunker asset that can contain those new fuel systems. Are they available? Are they readily available? Or are they in the other side of the world? And mobilization takes one, two, three, four, well, well, maybe several weeks before they're there. And how would you then respond if you're looking at remote locations? You know, if you look at LNG, especially in the cruise industry, generally the reason why they stepped into LNG a few years ago was because of sailing into areas whereby it was of a danger of sailing there with HFO or with the traditional fuels. However, if you go to the more remote areas in the world, are there responders in place to actually be there and to mitigate the risks if, for example, there is a, a, a containment issue, or again, the, pressure, the pressures are, are hiding and flaring is, is not an option, or will just take too long to flare in the meantime with four, five, six thousand people on board of a cruise vessel. Those types of, 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 of influences we are taking on board. Other than LNG and the alternative fuels for a selfish case, we then have the added challenges on top of it. Um, and that is not an, an easy one either. So while we are handling or managing today's challenges with container vessel fires, uh, undeclared cargo, um, having a cruise vessel with 5,000 people on board, how do you run a response like that? Um, we're looking today also with electrical vehicles going on board, with electrical vehicle fires and the access and how to access them. We're adding it, we're, we're heading towards a situation where we're adding complexity under complexity. So the complexities of the new cargo, of the complex cargo of today, um, 
added with a new fuel system on board. And that co component or complexity is of course a, a big change if you look at it compared to not even 10 years ago uh, on what the challenges are then and what they are today. And as lastly, I'll come back on later is sort of obviously where it all uh, goes into the whole port of refuge discussion uh, where these influencers are, are of importance. So port of refuge, um, this is just an example where things can get a little bit sticky on, on if there's an incident um, and what do you do. In generally, generally, this is the port of refuge discussion uh, is a topic that's been going on for, for many, many years. Uh, it started obviously with the, the likes of the Erika and these types of major incidents whereby there was a, 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 a release, there was a, a risk of sinking of a big catastrophe and which port is willing to take that burden and, and do and, and come up with a solution whereby the solvers can, can do something. Um, you know, there's of course good signs and good cases of the past. So the MSC Napoli was one of them, whereby the government took control and uh, avoid sinking, however, going aground on the, on the beachy area with a lot of uh, work after that. So, but nevertheless, the port of refuge is generally, if there's an incident, uh, the discussion we have. And it doesn't mean that it needs to go into port, but it's, let's say, an area where you take a casualty to container, whereby you have the time to stabilize her in good weather, and whereby you then work towards waste management process. If there was, for example, a fire, you know, getting the, uh, the dirty water off, uh, and of course, debunkering of whatever fuel it is uh, uh, into a safer uh, location, meaning a bunker vessel or, or similar. Um, so the port of refuge discussion is, is actually one of the first things a server or is already thinking of the moment he responds to a casualty. And therefore, having a port of refuge option and coming up with a solution, you need obviously the right permits in place. And that gets quite difficult if you're coming there with a uh, car carrier, with electrical vehicles on board and a new fuel system on board, which the Marine Authority has limited or zero knowledge of and is actually already hesitant to bring a, such a, yeah, you could say, a, you could say it is a straightforward uh, vessel, but, you know, going into the detail, it could be quite complex, uh, getting into the, a bay area or a port whereby the server can actually respond. And this to avoid sailing around with a casualty for many, many weeks uh, uh, through Europe or Middle East, what we've seen in the past of certain casualties. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done by, yeah, you could say the responders, but especially also the, uh, the owners, insurers who are all insuring or trading or working with the new fuel systems in order to be prepared and to have this preparation in place so that permissions and permits can be placed and can be obtained uh, in case there's an incident. And that is all about emergency response planning, getting the right expertise, running hazards, hazops, and PRAs, and et cetera, and to ensure that those types of, let's say, pre-planning is already in place ahead of a casualty. And that's not what we all see today with the traditional fuel types. You know, a lot is very ad hoc or reactive. There's some systems in place, but overall very limited because, again, the responders are very well acquainted with those, uh, with those challenges. But when it comes to the new challenges of the new fuel systems, much more needs to be done in order to ensure that if there's a casualty, of course, incidents happen. You cannot uh, step away of them in order to be, be to be prepared for them. On the right hand, you see um, uh, the, the whole Qatar, Qatar's response to Singapore. We'll come back on it later. Uh, of course, it's LNG as a cargo, not as a fuel. But they were running a lot of preparation work in order to ensure that if there was a casualty, that certain work that can be pre-planned, can be thought of, was already in place. Marcus, can I go to the next slide, please? As if by magic, Oliver. I think so. <laughs> and <laughs> that leads comment. me to um, to actually a, a real casualty. You know, it gives you a little bit of a, of a, of a, a view on, you know, if you're preparing yourself, if you're preparing as a ship owner, cargo owner, a salvage operator, insurer, in order to get things running. Um, this is the Algrafa LNG ESDS operation uh, back in 2013. So it's quite a while back. But I still feel or feel, I still find, or we find this casualty still a, an example um, uh, whereby being prepared really mitigates 
um, and it provides a fast track on providing a solution. And that's all based on, let's say, a preparedness system being running and being prepared for. Um, forget that it's LNG as a cargo. It's just about the casualty, you know, whereby uh, hazards, hazops, and QRAs were run well ahead of a of a real casualty taking pl taking place. Therefore, certain risk came out of that of of that of those scenarios that were run. Of course, it was related to a a grounder or grounding or a fire or a damage to the vessel whereby the cargo or you could say for the future, the fuel needs to be taken off. And are we are we having the right equipment and capability in place? So we had a, a response team which knew the vessels already by heart. Um, this was not only the salvor, but also the, uh, the the mooring masters, the the, the cargo or the LNG experts, uh, all, all again to be prepared and having the right equipment which is compatible and a full response plan in place on a, from a static perspective to a response. Uh, perspective and i can you know it has happened in singapore well i can tell you going to an mpa or to a government anywhere in the world and saying okay we have a casualty this is what it is and we have this all prepared this is all the equipment that we need it's already ready available it's being mobilized will be in 12 hours um we know what what kind of vessel this is and this is let's say the step-by-step -step approach we're going to do uh, in order to uh, to do an, an emergency sds operation and that confidence towards a marine authority uh, was 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 ideal. That gave them a lot of trust that we, things were not, let's say, engineered or thought of on the fly. People knew what was happening. And therefore, a plan was put into place. And therefore, you know, a certain amount of days was put into place to do the the ESDS. And the actual operation was was done very very fast. Um, and this is obviously how what type of work we as a salver are doing already today with certain customers. Uh, who are who is sailing with LNG or is planning to sail with ammonia and methanol. However, more needs to be done in order to get that to the next step. That the moment that a uh, a ship owner is is planning to sail with these new fuel systems, that they have all the response systems in place as far as practically possible. Mark, next slide. So that's for what I was like I said, running these scenarios, um, going through the, the the scenario planning together with the authorities, for example, where for example the the bunkering takes place, or with the insurers and the ship owners, whereby you have the let's say all the, the the packages together to ensure like what can what what can happen, what are the experiences that we know of today, and do we have the right equipment uh, in order to do a response, um, and what kind of equipment are we looking at, and where do we place it. And therefore leading into a let's say a certain response plan you could say somewhat similar to the oil and gas however marine focused and focused on actual solutions um, that you need for for a certain casualty but we still believe and we, we've seen the the the, the, the the proven parts of it that let's say 40 percent of a casualty can be prepared before a casualty taking place and a lot is based on the, on, the, on very straightforward components of good communication, that there's a better understanding what type of vessel it is, what is on board, uh, communication lines leading into an actual response and having the right equipment that, let's say, fits, that you have the right hoses and uh, the right fendering. The moment that a, a responder uh, provides, yeah, it's quite basic, that he's able to actually connect a, a hose for a, for a discharge uh, in, in a sense. So having the right, the, 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 let's say, the right plugs in place. Leading into a point where the advantages, and that's well going back to where what Marcus said at the very start, you know, we have a very we're fast tracking a a, a a change, a major change in the in the shipping today, and obviously the more we can do today to have the responders in place, the more the assets are insurable, that the risks are mitigated, and we are and it becomes more of a commodity again, similar to the HFO or MGO as we've seen uh, right now. And therefore, the partnering between clients, responders, stakeholders will enhance that and ensure that, yeah, again, those risks are mitigated. Last well, slide. Marcus, do you want to run this one as a recap? Uh, yeah. Yep, can do. Yeah, sure, yep. Oliver, not a problem. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we started off with that decarbonization is going to happen and it's going to happen probably at quite a speed, um, probably quicker than what. Uh, regulation um, can keep up with 
there's, there is no silver bullet. There's going to be quite a few um, different options. And what we're already seeing, like I say, is some shipping lines will, they're pursuing one option and not the other. Some are sticking with LNG, some are going with ammonia, some are going with hydrogen. It's It just depends. But there's going to be a lot of different uh, fuels out there. And like Oliver said, a lot of different systems. We need to make sure that everything is going to be compatible. It's going to be a lot more complex than what we've seen previously, whether it be HFO, IFO, very low sulfur fuel oils. Um, you know, it, 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 I think it's going to be more complex. Um, regulation is largely not yet established, or there are regulations that do exist, um, but they probably need to be adapted and amended to, uh, to pick up and accept um, these new fuels. So one example would be the, the IGF code, which, um, which allows tankers to use um, the cargo as a fuel, which I mentioned what Alan, happens with LNG at the moment, uh, ammonia is not an option because it's not because uh, it's toxic, it's toxicity, it doesn't permit it to be brought in to the engine room um, and obviously where it could be exposed to the ship's crew. Um, risks are increasing, like we said, and Oliver's touched on it. Um, you know, the complexity is increasing, but you know, the solutions and, and, and understanding what the scenarios can be uh, that we can find ourselves in, sort of like there's, there's work to be done there. If and touch wood, hopefully that won't happen. But you know, if there if there are events that those will be um, probably the catalyst for change, they'll be the learning opportunities. They'll be the ones where where the you know the greatest advances may be made. Um, so I, I say just looking through the rest of the books, I think we've covered most of these. I think again, and what we are seeing, Oliver's mentioned it, but the active role of ship owners, insurers. Um, and the response community. I mean, this is early days. It's very, um, like I say, at some some instances, the infrastructure doesn't exist, the technology doesn't exist, but there's a will, there's a drive. Um, there's some very big organisations um, that are looking into things uh, like this. Um, the Maersk, uh, McKinney Muller um, Foundation in Denmark, you know, they've got some big names. They're looking at ship designs for, that will run on ammonia. Um, you know, they look, they've got a design, they're going to be starting to look to get the funding to go into to production that. So there's a lot of drive from, from industry, um, which is, you know, they're stepping up to the plate in this one. Um, but say, so ultimately, um, you know, if we fail to prepare for an emergency or we're not prepared for an emergency, should one happen, um, you know, that the whole reputation and the reputational side of things could could be drawn into a little bit of uh, disrepute, as it were. So, and it and it kind of you know adversely affects the, the whole goals of the Paris Agreement. If uh, you know if some of these uh, greenhouse gases and, and things like LNG are being released um, in, in in large quantities uh, just because of there's a casualty in their venting. I think that's the end of the that is the end of the slide deck, Mark. So I'll stop sharing. I'll unmute. Yeah, no problems. That's fantastic stuff. Um, I'm going to. Uh, you've unshared i will reshare and hopefully pick up great i thought that was really good run through oliver marcus that was great a couple of things i've come of questions i've got to pose for you do you think that we are in the position in the situation where okay when we had deep water horizon lesson learned was that we need to pre-position lots of kit a complex kit around the world such that we can respond quickly are we looking about the set doing the same sort of thing, you know, maybe a basing lots and lots of quite complex kit such that it is more immediately available around the world for responders to use? And if so, who should fund it? Mm. I know there's two difficult questions, but uh, you're both bright guys. So, you know, I'm sure you've got the answers, but it, it's these questions which need to be asked. And are they ship owners are the insurers responsible are responders responsible for the investment in this kit because it's to do this properly and to do it safely you're going to need complex kit more complex kit than we perhaps as responders are used to having because yeah. the pressures yeah. that we're in with the pressures that one is dealing with in the way that these um the these gases are stored you know you can't have an unplanned release of this because it's the the pressure being released is is significant, but equally the hazard being released is also significant. Not for the crew on board, but for anyone who's in that environment, nearby environment. Yeah, 
Yeah, if, if I can kick off, uh, uh, Mark, on, on that one, is that, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, from, let's say, from a selfish side of things, right? I'm not looking yeah. at the spill side, but purely selfish side of things. Historically, there has been quite a few, not, not a lot, um, uh, let's say, uh, solutions in place whereby certain um, uh, um, oil and gas companies or LNG-related uh, uh, mm -hmm. production companies, if you could say so, so oil majors, both of yeah. them, have been working towards or have implemented a solution whereby there was, let's say, a solution lying on the shelf that was compatible with their ships and their cargo to ensure yeah. that there was, let's say, a fixed response with X amount of hours. Yeah. Um, and those instigate that those uh, those solutions all happened on the on the on the basis whereby they started trading with, for example, big LNG vessels that were not on the market yet. Uh, and actually, the insurers was pushing uh, the owners uh, and the operators to yeah to think about think about a solution on equipment, on expertise, uh, on running scenarios, etc. And actually, if you look at it today, towards if you would step into the ammonia, methanol, etc., likely in the beginning of such a implementation, this would be the best solution, right? That. The people who are, or the companies that, let's say, are trading or are entering this market with these new fuel systems, that they think about where can I get the right equipment in place, or where can I source it, and where can I get it? And in essence, the cell wars today do not have, let's say, foolproof ammonia uh, SDS kits lying on the shelf. Yeah. Definitely yeah. not. And it will be a quite a, a um, uh, let's say, a danger, also a risk for itself or to invest in such a kit. So a lot will be based on, yeah, let's say the operators and oil and gas companies, for example, that are stepping into uh, into providing or to trading with these fuel systems. So there, there has to be somewhat of, an, of, a, of a pressure coming from insurers, uh, from the regulatory side of things that push that forward whereby let's say those gaps on equipment or knowledge on uh, are, are are mitigated or are, are, are prepared for mm -hmm. similar that what you've seen in the past um, which of course is more common in the oil spill response environment uh, whereby there is equipment put on place on, on location or on standby by actually the end uh, producers yeah so actually i mean our, i mean marcus are the other are pni clubs involved in these discussions because they're, uh, they're the ones i mean I, I i i'll 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 reveal my cards now i'm an avid reader of ships monthly because i can get it online and and i read ships monthly every month and it comes out and it's talking about these new vessels have been ordered which are dual fuel and you know these are arriving and we're actually arriving on our door steps you know i mean bp have got their new uh, sorry not b p and o have got their new vessels with you know really sophisticated wonderful vessels but you know i mean we've got <laughs> significant risk in these vessels um arriving in our ports every every day and um but are how we how pre well prepared are we for a response to these to these vessels if they need it not so much the lng because as you say we understand it but very soon we're going to have container vessels driven by propelled by methanol with a with an alternative arriving in the port of Southampton, and I wonder how prepared we are for that. Yeah, I, I, I think yeah. like Oliver's probably alluded to, Mark. Is yeah. I wouldn't say we are completely prepared. Um, no. You know, and from my perspective, like I said before, I think in terms of what when we think about spill response, those days, and certainly with the alternative fuels, they they're, they're kind of gone. There's, they're, they're not. Um, sort of there's not yeah. booms and skimmers and that kind of yeah. stuff so yeah. certainly the the what you want to try and do is prevent that loss of containment so prevention yeah. is better than cure so it's the kind of the kit like the Oliver's talking about with salvage um you know and that's where we've kind of had conversations with with Oliver and looking at you know and, and blue tack and looking at those mm -hmm. things so yeah. um are we ready probably not no um yeah. I think it, what you do see is a lot like you say the the, the cruise companies and container lines are quite keen to push their green credentials but yep. um i think from conversations about with oliver there's probably only a, a minority of those that are prepared to look at those risks and and go so far down the road not sort of like completely put in a uh, a solution or a preparedness uh a service but it's 
yeah they're aware of them and they're thinking but they you know they want the intent is to do the right thing but there's not a not a push button that you can say right let's go if there was an incident not at the moment because i mean a question has been asked by ferozo albertus um what are the numbers regarding the type of vessels using alternative fuels currently operating versus oil driven vessels including low sulfur is there a projection available to indicate the trend of of the use of these vessels over the upcoming years now as i understand it there's less than 1% of vessels are currently driven using alternative fuels would you agree with that that's a figure i got from um, yeah. a search i did on with in in a database yeah correct i would say that that is say, the, the amount of let's say I'm not even looking at LNG, but purely looking beyond LNG, it's it's very it's it's, it's not a lot, uh, yeah. and de definitely below the one percent number. Yeah. I believe uh, DMV has really well uh, databases running whereby you oh, can okay. see the actual ordering between the, the, the new fuel systems. Yeah. I believe last year there was roughly three hundred uh, vessels ordered uh, with alternative fuels yeah. on board. So yeah, in the sh scheme of things, it's it's very limited mm -hmm. last year. But obviously, yeah. we'll see a big rise coming in in the next couple of years, and a lot of yeah. ship owners, you know, it's similar to with a responder, and this makes it really difficult. You know, if you're a ship owner today, with with and you're running a chemical container, a tanker, etc., uh, and you want to be prepared for the new uh, the new the, the decarbonization, the, the targets. Now, first of all, you work on sailing optimization. You now that's the easiest thing to do, uh, likely also the cheapest. But then you need to work towards a strategy, a long-term strategy of what fuel systems do we need? And what are you, what mix are you going for? Is it going to be ammonia? Is it methanol? Um, uh, is it hydrogen in the longer term? Uh, when do, when will the new vessels take place? And there's a lot of companies and also classification is guiding those ship owners to hopefully making the right choice. Um, but of course, we don't know where the emphasis will lie on. And the same goes for the responders. You know, should we as a self war focus more on methanol because today it's all about methanol or should we actually skip methanol more and immediately go to ammonia because ammonia is actually maybe going to be yeah. the golden the golden solution or go another and, and we just don't know and therefore yeah. we're getting a little bit in this yeah you could say in a, in a market whereby we're all trying to find a way uh, uh, uh cargo operators ship owners responders etc yeah, I think that's true. I mean, you will get early adopters because they're brave, they're bold, they've got shareholders who think, well, we've got to make a change and we need to make a statement. This is part of our the image that we want um, and it's good for our reputation. But actually, we're going to have to really see which way we go. Um, and we're going to have to, but I, but I agree with you, it's going to be a bit of a hockey stick curve, I think, with the development in the rollout of these vessels. As you said, I didn't realize that DNV had a database, so that's a good thing to flag up to people. Um, no. yeah, yeah, and I think that's a good place to look. But I, I see it increasing, but it, it will steadily increase. It's not going to be a radical change. But what is interesting is that the change is occurring now and we're seeing it. We're seeing it. And that's a positive thing in terms of meeting our meeting the IM or doing meeting the IMO's um, greenhouse gas emission goals. Next question, Brian Stewart has asked, we're seeing many dual fuel, low sulfur fuel oil and LNG in our port. It's really interesting around an LNG spill, but as you alluded to in your intro, what is the present expert view of, halt, of handling ultra low sulfur fuel oil spill equipment wise, e.g. booms and belt skimmers? One for probably Marcus really, or? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what? That just to, I don't think I've understood the question. Okay, the question is really how good are we? Uh, how good are we at dealing with ultra low sulfur fuel oils, oil spills? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Um, Can I just? I, I will inter. I'll throw a few things in because um, what I what thing that I speaking to quite a lot of people. If you're on it straight away, it absorbs relatively easily into absorbance. Would you agree with that? I've yeah, I've seen certainly with the well, yeah. I think with you're referring to the Wakashio and Wakashio that we've seen. And, yeah. and others which have been done. Yeah. But if it's been in the water for let's say if it's been in warm water for let's say 40 48 hours, it starts to stratify within the water yeah. column. 
I think is what, I, what I've gathered, which then makes it harder to recover. Yeah, I mean, I think I know we've had we, we've seen uh, instances where you know the ores behaved, and I guess this comes down to how the what the blend is of the yeah. of the low sulfur, the very low sulfur fuel oil, and there's so many different blends, and yeah. manufacturers are quite protective of their of their um of their recipe, as it were. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, we've seen bunker spills where. It, it, it sheens quite readily, but then when it actually hits things like breakwaters and 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 um, sort of like key sides, that it actually, in essence, it emulsifies. So it's, it's yeah. can, behaves, it can behave in quite a, a bizarre way. Yeah. The the benefit would be, you know, if it's the case in a port, then hopefully, like you say, you can be there quite quick. You can contain, you can get your skimmers yeah. in, you can get your sorbents and yeah. and that kind of stuff. But yeah, it, it is a bit of a game changer. The, the low sulfur fuel law. Yeah, it's all about the speed of response to it, isn't it, really? And yeah. I think the more people have, are aware of the risk and they have the ability to respond, but the response needs to be now. It doesn't need to be in two weeks' time. Yeah. Because it's going to be very complicated and quite messy. Yeah. Hopefully, Brian, that answers your question. Um, has anyone any more questions that they want to ask? And if you wish to, please just chip in. Oh, James, James Mitchell, please far away. Uh, where where are you from, uh, James? What company are you from? Yeah. From Merrill, uh, Merrill Consulting okay. uh, in Rennes in France. Okay, good. Please, uh, back in the 1990s, CARB, which is the California Air Resources Board, uh, wanted to introduce methanol as a fuel for buses. But the major uh, hindrance to that was the fact that if they had an accident, if the fuel went on fire, the fire is invisible. And this was a, considered a major hazard for uh, uh, emergency response people. And in fact, at that time, the only way you could sell methanol was if you put 15% uh, gasoline into it so that it would have a visible flame. So I just wanted to, to point that out in this uh, scenario that you are dealing with a a fuel that if it goes on fire, you're not going to be able to see that fire. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's actually one of the big, that's the one of the big negatives for it. And that's been raised in quite a lot of discussions about methanol, adopting methanol. Um, there is a feat, there is rather like when you use gas for in domestic use, they put a dye in which says, you know, which, sorry, they put a, a an, an odor, they an odor inducer in there so that you can smell it to make it. So at least you're aware that the hazard exists, but you're quite right. And I, I suspect that there are, as I understand, in fact, I know there is a laboratory which is doing work on burning fuel, burning methanol with a diet, with a, with an additive in it, which emits a vapor when it, when it, when it ignites. So I think it was the same sort of thing. It, there was quite a lot of work done by the Southwest uh, Research Institute in uh, Albuquerque on this subject, they tried 200 different compounds. They came up with a compound that gave a visible flame at uh, 15% of uh, additive. Um, And uh, really the the idea of putting an additive into methanol, I don't think works actually, this is the problem. Because probably it's gonna interfere with the combustion in your engine as well. So that it it is possible to to do an additive in a fire response uh, extinguisher but not in the fuel itself. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you, James. Any other questions from anyone? Please stick your hand up and, um, uh, if you have a question. Okay, well, um, it's very interesting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or no, two weeks ago, um, we had our spring conference at Chem UK Expo, and we had a great presentation from Bill Atkinson, who's the Chief Scientific Advisor for Adler and Allen. And he was talking about uh, alternative fuels, and he's raised some of the same points that have been raised here. And I think there is, we were looking really primarily at the inland side, the four courts, fuel distribution centres, things like that. And it, but what we're seeing is that there are, there's no silver bullet, there's no easy solution, and that we're going to have to work our way through the problems. But the more that we discuss the problems, the more that we can work out what solutions we need. And I think it's the more often that we have these discussions and we appreciate 
what the what the hazards are, but equally how we can deal with those hazards, the better prepared we will be. Because in all of these in in all of these cases, as we've mentioned, you know, uh, speed of response is essential to protect lives, to protect the environment, uh, but and also to protect the risk that 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 that, that exists from the vessel itself. Um, so it's really good that we've had this discussion. I suspect we'll keep returning to this topic. Um, and as I delve deeper into ships monthly, I'm sure other issues will arise. But I'd like to thank very much uh, Marcus Russell from Oil Spill Response and Oliver Timofy from Blue Tap Marine for giving of their knowledge and their expertise um, today. I think it's been a really, really good. Um, it's been really, really good. Uh, it's been a good discussion and it's one that will, will obviously continue. Um, feel free to use the association and, and the tools that we have to be involved in those discussions or to host discussions that you want to have. Um, within the Marine and Manufacturers Working Group, you know, we are we are really open to, uh, to, to topics that need discussing and solutions that need to be found. So we're very happy to be involved in that. But as, as I don't think anyone else has any more questions. I, again, I've given our thanks, but I would say that it's been really interesting to spend time discussing this topic today. And I'd like to thank you very much. As I say, this has been recorded. Um, I will be doing an edit and I'll try and get it up on our website by Friday so that you can spend your whole weekend looking, reviewing this, uh, reviewing this, um, this webinar. But do share it with colleagues because I think it's a really pertinent discussion to have at this time. So I'd like to thank you. Thanks, thanks for joining. And thank you very much again to Marcus and Oliver for a great webinar. Have a very good day. And um, Catch up in due course. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark.